Hello, a very warm welcome to day two of Engaging Evidence. Um, my name is Jo McKenzie and I'm a, an Associate Professor in the Methods and Evidence Synthesis Unit within the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University and I'll be the Chair of the session today. So let me first begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. For me, this is the Gunai Kurnai people, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and emerging leaders, and extend that acknowledgement to all of the lands on which we gathered today. The theme of today's uh, plenary is research integrity, which for those of us in the business of evidence synthesis is a particularly critical issue biased, fabricated, fraudulent and erroneous data and primary research has a great potential to obviously compromise the trustworthiness and validity of findings and systematic reviews and also infiltrate other uh, synthesis products such as clinical practice guidelines. So the plan uh, for this plenary today is that we'll have three presentations and uh, time permitting we'll have a clarifying question at the end of each. Uh, we'll then conclude the session with a panel discussion um, where the speakers will be joined by Professor Lisa Barrow, who many of you will know, um, and she is the Senior Editor of Research Integrity for Cochrane. Um, you are able to post questions um, in the Q&A box throughout the presentation, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, and please also engage on Twitter using the hashtag EE21. Okay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day. Uh, who is Dr. Lisa Parker. Lisa is a medical doctor, ethicist, and researcher based at the Charles Perkins Center at the University of Sydney. Um, and she's currently working with Cochrane, um, the, the Cochrane Research Integrity Group. The title of Lisa's talk is How to Be a Research Detective, Early Warning Signs of Research Fraud. Um, so I hand it over to you, Lisa. Please begin when you're ready. Thanks so much, Joe, and I hope I've um, sparked your interest with that title. Um, sometimes I think it's hard to talk about research integrity, although you're all here for that purpose. But uh, sometimes I think in the broader scheme of things, students, perhaps uh, and other researchers get bored by it. So I thought if we made it about being a research detective, people might be um, might be interested. Anyway, that's uh, that's one of my ideas about where we're going here. Now, um, let me just see if I can. Can you all see my slides? there I might just um, uh, stop my video and then we can um, then we can keep going all right okay so uh, I think many of you might know that um, that we've had in Cochrane um, some recent papers about problematic studies one of the issues with problematic studies and how to deal with them is is right at the outset there's no really agreed definition of what a problematic study is. Uh, so, so it includes research misconduct, other people call it questionable research practice fraud or, or untrustworthy studies. So it'd be interesting to do some more work and that's part of what we're trying to do around getting some consensus on um, the, the terminology. So within that, then there are many different types of problems. There's made up data or fraud, there's altered data, which often called falsification, there's, there's inappropriate stats, and incomplete reporting, plagiarism, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. And what we've seen over the last few years is increasing recognition of some of the different types um, and scale of this um, problematic study. So people are becoming aware of big paper mills um, that are producing completely fake um, studies. Uh, we're also getting big fake uh, data on uh, randomized controlled trials. People are starting to realize that that's uh, becoming an issue and then there are individual um, papers here and there that might be tweaked or altered uh, by individual researchers as a one-off. So there's a few things that we're trying to deal with there. Obviously these are big problems as Joe said, big impact on evidence-based healthcare and downstream on, on the research uh, body of evidence and public trust in science but at a more kind of personal prosaic level I guess in Cochrane particularly it's very time consuming if you're trying to do a, a systematic reviews to working out well which of these studies can I actually trust. The publishers and people, editors and peer reviewers in the industry as well, also extremely time consuming. Peer review is one of the, um, is one of the big pillars of um, publishing industry and uh, one of the ways that we try and manage research integrity. Um, but, but peer review uh, has problems and its own limitations. Um, 
uh, although it is a, a major plank. Of course, one of the things that's happening now is that peer review um, is always part of publication, and we did a big study comparing preprints uh, with their final peer-reviewed publications to see if there was any difference between the two, which might at least partly be due to that peer review process. So this was in conjunction with uh, Lisa Barrow and her colleagues, and we did a, a study uh, looking at um, pub journal publications on COVID-19 that were published last year. And we looked at the studies that also had a preprint that were published. So we found 67 studies, and we looked at were there any differences in the way the preprint and the publication reported the outcomes and uh, discussed, uh, was there any evidence of spin in both or either? So we found that, that there were quite a lot of discrepancies between the preprint and the peer reviewed paper. 66% um, of discrepancies. And things like the paper had new outcomes like toxicity um, discussions. The numbers sometimes had changed. Um, statistical tests and subgrouping had sometimes changed. And we also noticed that there was spin, um, sometimes um, less spin in the peer reviewed, although in one case, spin was added to the peer reviewed article. But spin generally was, was present in about a third of cases which was um, interesting. And obviously peer review is not the only difference between um, a preprint and a journal publication, but, but an interesting uh, indication of what the benefits, I suppose, of peer review and um, the possible limitations. Uh, and this is just um, uh, our peer review paper and our, um, our uh, preprint paper, if anyone's interested in following that up. So, the current study that we're doing uh, as part of the Research Integrity Group at, at Cochrane is um, to look at how we can be better research detectives. Uh, what, what could we use to help people who are doing systematic reviews and uh, publications to detect problematic studies? And we know that there are already a variety of tools that are used and proposed to investigate problematic studies. And I think uh, the next speaker, Ben, is going to have a uh, talk to you about some of the methods that he uses. So these tools use things like uh, statistics tests, plagiarism checks, um, publishers do submit tests for submission anonymously. For example, if multiple papers are being submitted from the same um, computer at a very similar time, that might raise a flag. Um, People engaged in systematic reviews on a particular content topic are able to scrutinise all publications from an author or author group, and that, that can be quite illuminating, um, and checking of protocols and so on. But, but there's no validated and easy to use screening tool that, that can help us. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to explore a little bit in this study. Essentially, what we're doing is, is asking, it's a, it's a qualitative study, an interview study, asking people who are experts or well experienced in this topic, how do they identify problematic studies? Um, and what do they think uh, should be included in a, um, in a study, yeah, in a tool that might help flag problematic studies? As I said, so it's a, a qualitative interview study. We're expecting to talk to about 25, 30 people, and we're speaking to academics, including Cochrane people involved in systematic reviews. Also speaking to people in the publishing industry and academics who measure researchers, perhaps with, with an interest in research fraud and misconduct. Uh, and asking about their views and experiences, and we'll use a thematic, thematic analysis um, research methodology to um, do the analysis. And as is common in qualitative studies, we're able to use the preliminary interviews to shape the questions um, in the later interviews and to, and to shape um, the recruitment, which is very useful. So far, actually, I think that might be 22 now interviews uh, we've had. So, so we've, we've got some really interesting views and experiences uh, that we've been able to elucidate already so far. And look, this is very preliminary results because things are still ongoing. But some of the things we found that might be useful early warning signs are the typical things like, is there ethics? You know, is there an ethics number? Is there an ethics approval? Is there a protocol registration? Um, 
And then things like, let's make use of the existing tools. Um, let's make sure we've got someone on the team who knows how to look for retraction notices. Um, let's, let's scroll through Retraction Watch or maybe use something like PubPeer and see if there are any alerts out on paper. Um, and then the, the more kind of time consuming but also relatively well known thing, are there any problematic figures perhaps in the baseline data? Is there a problem that, that jumps out of us there is the text. Uh, are there things like tortured phrases that suggest it's just gone through some sort of thesaurus process um, to, to get around the plagiarism tool? Uh, is there a font that kind of goes in and out of different um, types that might indicate just cutting and pasting from other papers? Uh, is there unusual phrasing? Is there a particularly outlier data? That might be a flag that we need to look a bit more closely. So there's, there's lots of things in there that we could use. Um, and then the design of the study itself is the aim of any meaningful value or does it look like it's just been kind of made up by potentially a paper mill? Um, is the method plausible or are there some things in the reporting of the methods that suggest that this couldn't have been done? Is it recruiting 5,000 people in six months, you know, just unlikely to have happened? So, so some kind of close reading of the paper there. And then are there any of those automated tools, um, um, AI that, that's coming on, and some of them are already here, stats checks, um, turn it in, other sort of plagiarism tools, um, and the submission uh, ones that I mentioned earlier that um, some of the publishing industry can use. So they're the kinds of things that we're hearing about. And I think interestingly, uh, I'm getting mixed views on this, but some people are suggesting that really, if you're doing a systematic review, for instance, you need a mindset shift. You need to assume that this study is fraudulent until you can kind of get some really good evidence that it's uh, legit. And that's quite different from the way we normally work in uh, evidence-based research, I think. So interesting views that are coming through on that. Um, of course, it's not just about what can we do at that systematic review level? It's are there any kind of preventions that we can do further upstream to prevent those um, problematic studies from being published? So, are there any problems? Anything we can do at the research level? Can we get um, uh, institutions to reduce the pressure on researchers, reduce the pressure on clinicians to to publish in order to get advancement? Um, are there there kind of huge system changes that can happen? Um, and institutional buy-in seems to be a big theme coming through as well. So institutions need to educate students. And, and in some regions in the world, that's really still a very much a preliminary, just kind of starting to happen. Um, and institutions, can they be more proactive in the investigations? And can they be better at supporting people who, who may themselves be accused of fraud, but uh, kind of just... Um, as a nefarious accusation, um, people are suggesting that institutions don't know how to deal with that side of things as well. So that's coming through interestingly. Uh, and then in the publishing process, how do we prevent problematic studies from getting through into publication? There's some suggestion that maybe we need actual regulation of academic publishers in the same way that we regulate um, medical practitioners very, very strongly. Should we have some sort of very strong oversight and regulation of academic publishers. Now we've got self um, guidance from within the industry, but there's not a lot of stick behind that. Is that the best way forward? Should we change that? There's some interesting ideas coming through there. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about what open access can and cannot do, insisting on um, access to patient data, access to um, peer reviews, for instance, and pros and cons of those things, which I think is interesting. Some of the challenges, um, no matter how far we um, go down this path, it, arguably people who've got a lot of money to make out of a paper mill will just go that, much, that, that bigger step further uh, and continue to evolve and new tactics to evade the systems that we've got in place. But you know, that, should that stop us from trying? Seemingly uh, uh, not. Uh, I've already touched on the potential problem of risk of harm to researchers from, from overcall. If, if we're very suspicious all the time, could some researchers' reputations be trashed? How do we better support people so that it's okay to ask the questions uh, and it doesn't necessarily imply um, an accusation of fraud? And if people do get accused, how can we support them 
um, to reject that accusation if, if the accusation itself is unjust. So far we've got limited data from the lower and middle income countries. We've got a little bit coming through, but it, they have, but, you know, there are different sets of challenges there. So if there's anybody listening who's um, got experience in lower and middle income countries and would like to tell me about their experience and views, I'd be very happy to, um, to hear about that. Um, but uh, certainly a, a lot of interesting stuff coming through. And I, I suppose what we hope to produce is some sort of guidance for Cochrane people and others doing systematic reviews, maybe some help for publishers on, on just how they might be able to manage these systems um, uh, and screen so that they, they can identify one studies that need further, uh, deeper uh, review uh, and some suggestions about upstream issues as well. I hope I've left a little bit of time for questions. Um, perhaps I should turn my That's screen wonderful. Off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And, and you have indeed left some time for questions. So um, I might just have a, um, a quick question, which is in some ways, um, if we make the assumption that uh, studies are fraudulent, if that's our kind of beginning premise, um, there's a lot of work, I guess, that we have to do to prove otherwise. And how do we balance that against the need for kind of, uh, you know, rapid evidence synthesis? Um, yeah, that's a super good question. And look, I'm not sure, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, variation in people's views about whether we should sort of be, be have that assumption of fraud until proven otherwise. And, uh, um, you know, I think it's something that we, that we could throw up into the wider scientific community for a bit of debate and discussion about that because as you said it has all sorts of um, negative connotations as well in terms of what does it do if we're really trying to change things rapidly what does it do for public trust in science actually maybe it might improve it if we show that we're interrogating our work but on the other hand it might decrease public trust in science so yeah i don't have the answers to that but i think uh, I'd, I'd be keen to see a broader discussion in um, the scientific community about those kinds of things thank you and just uh time for one question we've got lots of questions coming through um what are your thoughts on training or improved resources for peer reviewers to help them identify problematic papers? yeah well really that's i think probably perhaps the first step that we of the outcomes from this study that would come through and i i'm you know, I'm surprised that there's limited um, training and resources for peer reviewers. And I suppose what, what, you know, one thing we've talked about doing is maybe putting up a web page at Cochrane with a whole lot of tools and some guidance. Um, you know, some of the publishing people that I've spoken to say that they offer this kind of peer, training for peer reviews and it's got very little uptake. So I guess peer review in itself is already time consuming. Maybe people don't want to add to that. Burden. But if you're doing a systematic review, maybe it's a different story. I also wonder, you know, some some of the people I'm speaking to in, in institutions in uh, other parts of the world have quite um, solid undergraduate training programs on on this kind of thing. And um, I'd like to see that being rolled out. And, you know, maybe, as I said right at the beginning, maybe we could make it sound a bit more interesting by calling it being a research sleuth or a research detective rather than, you know, this is how you can do research integrity. But I think there would be a market for people interested in, in developing those skills. And I think that would be great uh, to have those people, um, you know, more of those people around in the community. Thank you so much, Lisa, for your presentation and the insights into the uh, questions. Um, so now I'd like to warmly welcome our next speaker, uh, who is Professor Ben Moll. Uh, ben is an obstetrician gynaecologist based at Monash, who considers his core business to make medical knowledge in women's health. He was born and trained in the Netherlands and has a large international network of collaborators. His professional um, adage is a day without randomization is a day without progress. So something I'm sure most of us would agree with. Uh, the title of Ben's talk is We Have Evidence, But Do We Know If The Data Are True? So thanks very much, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Joan, for introducing and apologise for mixing up the problem. Uh, the, the, the program, my um, Zoom wanted an update and I was not able to uh, so switch the computers, but um, here I am. Here are my disclosures. Just confirm, can you see my slides and hear me? Yes, we can see. And Good. Hear. Okay, and, and to set, set the scene, already done by uh, Lisa, this is an overview um, of all things that can go wrong in 
um, uh, clinical research. It, it goes from unintended error on the left upper side to illegal human experiments on the right lower side. And, and I think in this session we address really serious issues, falsification and uh, fabrication. So I will talk about my own story with fraud. I will talk about how to detect it and then the consequences and how to deal with it. My story starts, I work in the field of obstetrics gynecology with a study on um, myoma uh, removal that was, that was published and a study on polyps. And uh, these papers seem to be independent, but if you have a bit of a clearer read, then it turns out that the two papers actually have exactly the same numbers and also exactly the same uh, tables, uh, including age and distribution of polyps in myoma. And what had happened, it was basically that one author, Dr. Schoek here, had copied the whole uh, article on polyps, changed polyps to myomas and then published it. So that was uh, detected actually by somebody doing a systematic review uh, and thought that person was, uh, he was mixing up uh, uh, papers um, in the review and that paper was retracted. Interestingly, nobody at that time looked at the at the other work of uh, uh, Dr. Schock here. So, so then I was aware of it. I had several experiences as peer reviewer and as editor when I raised concerns. Um, and then authors moved away and went to other journals. I was actually able to address that by keeping a copy of the initial suspicious papers. And then um, uh, a PhD student from the Netherlands came over, Esme Bordewijk. And I asked her to look specifically at, at the group of papers that I thought uh, were problematic. And, and after a couple of days, she came back and she says, well, if I look into different, author, different papers from the same author uh, with different studies and different total numbers of patients included, then there is actually a big similarity in uh, baseline tables. And you can see that here, each green dot means that it's exactly the same number and each red dot means that it changes um, with one point or one decimal point. And that didn't happen once, but it happened in many of the tables of these authors. And we made a leak table of that. So from the 18 papers that this author published, in green, you can see that there is little similarity that can happen by chance. But in red, there is a large number of uh, uh, tables that are uh, copied. And then the concern is obviously that these papers are published in high impact journals and uh, widely cited. Uh, interestingly, she, she then went back into this show here that was the author where I, I started with. And then she had a different way of searching. She, she, she used Google um, to see if there were papers with exactly the same title. And she found actually that the strategy of show here was finding another paper that was published earlier and, and copying that. So we've addressed that in a separate paper. So, so I think it's important to realize that if we want to screen for scientific fraud, we should do that either preferably at submission before papers are accepted and otherwise during meat analysis. Um, to make a real diagnosis of fraud, I think you need the individual participant data and go to the author and in the end um, individual participant data will be the uh, standard. So, so based on the work of I just showed and other work we have, we are developing a uh, checklist for research integrity um, and I will discuss that shortly. I think it's quite powerful to, um, to look at the governance, trial registration. If trials are not registered then that is uh, suspicious. Um, look at the author group, a uh, small number of authors for a big study is problematic. Look if the authors has previously uh, uh, published problematic papers that have been retracted. Look at the plausibility of the intervention usage. I, I consider it quite powerful that I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and a methodologist at the same time. So you should really ask yourself if the data that you see are uh, feasible. The time frame is, is important. So look how fast a paper is submitted after the study was uh, completed. Uh, if, an, if an outcome 
require six or nine months to be collected, then you can't submit the paper within one or three, two months after, um, uh, um, after completion. Um, dropout rates, um, fabricated studies are often uh, perfect. Also, we notice that fabricated studies often have perfectly comparable groups, two of 50 or two of 100, etc. Baseline characteristics are, 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 are powerful, specifically in RCTs. They can't be too comparable, but they also cannot be too much, uh, um, too, too, uh, too different. Uh, so if you have an RCT, your baseline characteristics are very different, then that indicates that they were, they were potentially not the consequence of randomization. Uh, and finally, look at the outcomes, see if the treatment effect is realistic, uh, large effect size with small sample size um, and conflicting information between outcomes are all signs of uh, uh, potential uh, fraud. Um, so what I found powerful is if you suspect fraud also to go to the work of a uh, whole author. So you see all kinds of things, many studies done at the same time, copying of tables, um, etc. And also look up the trial registry. That is also a very powerful uh, instrument that we have. This was a particular author where um, we, 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 we thought there would be uh, problems, but we could and still cannot prove that actually from the baseline table. But if you then look into the trial registration, it turns out that the same author has registered and completed more than 20 studies. And if you ask him what happened to that studies, then he says, well, that's none of your business, which is obviously um, uh, potentially problematic. So that about uh, uh, detection. One issue that is very often mentioned is how big is the problem? Is it not just maybe 1% of the papers or less? Unfortunately, I don't think that is the case. I think it affects 20% at least of the papers uh, that we are seeing in uh, meta-analysis, and I will show some evidence for that. This is outside my own field. This is work from John Carlisle, who is an anesthesiologist. He works for the journal Anesthesia, and he screens all the individual data of RCTs that are submitted to the journal. And this is how he qualifies papers in terms of false data and zombie data and you see that it that it comes up to particular regions of the world as high as 70 percent uh, zombie data john yonanidas wrote an uh, editorial on that and, and the, estimated that there might be hundreds of thousands of zombie randomized clinical trials and uh, if i go back to my uh, own field this is a, this is an example of um, progesterone in the prevention of preterm birth. This is the standard Cochrane meta-analysis that is published. This is the individual participant data meta-analysis on the same topic that um, has been published in the Lancet uh, earlier this year. And if you look at the flow chart of this uh, IPD, then from the, um, what is it, 49 available RCTs, 31 share data and 18 do not share data and it's important to realize that these are all relevantly recent randomized clinical trials and if you a, a, a breakdown of that then it turns out that some areas in the world do quite good so europe the us um, the large majority of authors is able to share data australia is even reaching a hundred percent the only tri trial that that was done in australia actually shared data but, but the, the, the problem, and that is a very sensitive issue to, to say, is in low resourced countries, and specifically, I must say, in the Middle East. Uh, John Carlisle showed that also, where only a few authors were able to share uh, data. And then a final topic, um, endometrial in injury as a treatment to improve uh, fertility outcomes. We have assessed that literature and published it and compared it to people who share IPD. And if we check these papers for integrity, then we score about one third as trustworthy, 
one third as high risk of problems and, and the middle category. And that quite um, mimics the, uh, uh, the, the, the ability to share data. So again, that same problem that people who do not share data actually have published studies that are high risk of integrity. And I don't have any slides of that, but I noticed that other speakers address uh, COVID-19 and there also, uh, for example, in the um, example of hydrochloroquine and ivermectin, the estimate is that at least 20% of the recently published RCTs in that area are uh, fabricated. So finally, and I think this is a very important discussion, how do we deal with detected fabrication? I'll give you one example to see, uh, to show of how think I broke, how, how broken our system is. Um, this is an RCT that was published in uh, the journal Pregnancy and Hypertension. It was a study that um, uh, claimed to have recruited more than 500 women um, who, with hypertension who were treated with methyl dopa, nifidipin, or got no treatment. And when I saw that study together with my colleague George Sade, uh, we already really questioned whether that study would be true, and we wrote a letter to the editor. This makes you vulnerable because you're going to be visible. Um, uh, uh, but I think it's quite powerful at the beginning of a process of concern about the study to, to put that into, um, into writing, so to say, and to document that. So our concern was unfeasible sample size, unfeasible um, uh, treatment effect, and also unethical to have a non-intervention group. But to our surprise then, a year later, another paper was published from the same group that actually very much looks like the other trial, about 500 couples, two or, or uh, women, two of the three interventions arms are the same, only nifidipine is replaced by labetabol. And this study was done in the same center, in the same period, and it was registered actually at the same day even in the trial registry. And then it didn't stop there because the numbers of outcomes and, and uh, for, for mother and baby in uh, the studies, so the upper row is, is the first uh, study, the lower row is the, is, the, um, is, the, is, the, is the second study. In red are exactly the same data out of sample sizes of 500, the same uh, numbers. And in yellow, there is just a switch from 26 to 48 that becomes 48 and 26 here. Can't you get it any clearer? And then, Obviously, the trouble comes because we we wrote a letter to the editor to the other journal, no adequate response, nothing visible, and here comes the influential meta analysis that actually claims that one of the treatments that was superior in these fabricated studies that I just showed um, is the best treatment. So I wrote a letter to the editor uh, of the of, of the American Journal and said we're basically flying a Boeing 737. We know that the software is wrong, but still we continue. And this author has other papers with similar similarities. So these are two other papers of this same author, where if you look into the baseline table, there is clearly evidence of uh, uh, data copying. And if that is not enough, and somebody else uh, pointed me at that, Actually, a large number of the papers that this author has, has published for the categorical data, there are even numbers. Now, this ha doesn't happen by chance. The chance that this happens in a study is one in a billion. But this author has many of these papers. Up to 20 papers have these, uh, have these problems. And what is, the, what is the response of the editors after um, a very long period of, of, uh, of uh, discussing with them? They write that uh, they went to the university involved, that is Manufia University, um, and uh, they asked Manufia University to do an investigation themselves. And in the meantime, they have a very euphemistic um, expression of concern published after two years after flagging uh, the problem. And this is the response of Manufia University. So this is the letter that they are currently sending to everybody who asks for their data who says well due to regulations we are not able to share any data from studies that have been done 
more than uh, two years ago. So I think we need, really need a discussion of how we deal with this problem. This is a summary of some other responses from editors. Uh, I really have no time to do this. The journal gets 80 submissions per week. Um, don't be so worried. It exists in all specialties and in every country. Uh, we are working on it. Please be patient. Uh, um, uh, and this last response that I told you from um, 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 Mansoura University. So to summarize, um, I think there's two, three levels of the problem of data fabrication. Where it happens, we should obviously try to understand how that happens, support people who want to do the good thing on the ground. Problem number two is that peer review, specifically in the low impact journals, is um, of very poor quality and misses uh, papers. I think also that the question, are the data true, is actually not systematically asked. And, and problem number three, and I'm therefore very glad that I can present here, the majority of the academic um, uh, community is looking away. So scientific fraud, I'm afraid, exists on a relatively large scale, at least 20%. We're able to detect it. And the biggest challenge uh, I think are at the level of governance. And with this, I give back to the chair. Thanks very much, uh, Ben. That was very insightful um, and also quite, uh, well, alarming is what I would um, say. Oh, I've got one question that I want to raise here, um, and maybe this is something that we could also bring up in the panel discussion, but the task of detecting fraudulent studies seems substantial and potentially specialist with a high likelihood of missing problematic studies when streamlined review methods are used. Given this, should we be working towards a coordinated system that runs checks for warning signs that could be linked or integrated with citations in um, bibliographic databases? Yeah, that I, I think I think we should. And I think the main thing that we should do is put the question, are the data true on the agenda? I, I think we have never actually, we've always taken for face value and based on trust that people have done an honest study and, and jumped immediately on the quality of the study and bias, etc. But I'm afraid that the question, are the data true, should be systematically uh, asked. Um, and I think also, so I've, I've spoken to the editors of the example that I just gave, they, they simply cannot believe that the study is, is, is made up completely. So there is also kind of still a lack of a, awareness that, so, so part of their reaction is explained by the fact that it can't be that they have completely made up two studies. At least some, some study must be true or something. So they give people the benefit of the doubt, so to say. Well, it is a shift from where we're sitting in terms of trusting research. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is that kind of shift that needs to take place. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll move on. Thank you again, Ben. Um, so I'd like to introduce our last speaker in this session, who's Associate Professor Zach Mum. Uh, Zach is the Director of the Evidence-Based Healthcare Research Division of JBI, Director of the JBI Adelaide Grade Centre, and Chair of the Guidelines International Network. Um, he's also a recipient of an NHMRC investigator grant to examine diverse methods of evidence synthesis. And he currently leads the JBI Predatory um, Publishing Working Group, which leads us on to the topic of his talk today, which is predatory publishing and systematic reviews. What is the problem and what should we do? Thanks very much, Zach. Thanks, Joe. And firstly, thank you to Steve and the Scientific Committee for inviting me to speak here today in what's been an incredibly interesting session. Uh, so my topic for today is on predatory publishing and systematic reviews. What is the problem and what should we do? And it really builds nicely on Ben and Lisa's presentations as well. So by means of introduction and also my uh, interest and disclosures, uh, Joe's just kindly uh, mentioned all of these um, and I have no direct or indirect financial conflicts of interest. I'd also like to acknowledge that here in Adelaide at, in, at JBI, uh, I am on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Ghana land and I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. 
So uh, what I'm hoping to speak about in the next 13 or 14 minutes is really a bit of an introduction to predatory journals, uh, what this means for systematic reviewers and what we've been working on here at JBI with our, with our working group about what systematic reviewers can actually do when they come across studies from predatory journals for their systematic review. But let's start off with predatory journals. And, you know, sometimes I feel like I've made it. Sometimes I feel like I'm having a really, really good week. And, and, and that's because I receive all of these invitations to participate in editorial boards or emails to write a book or a chapter, uh, to speak at multiple conferences or uh, very much so in uh, invited submissions to journals. But if you actually look into these emails, you can start to see that sometimes they're coming in in fields where I have actually no expertise or experience. Uh, maybe I've published something slightly similar, but really they just seem to be coming out of the blue. And what this happens is actually it starts to fill up your inbox. And I'm sure anyone who has ever published a paper, you seem to all of a sudden start to get onto these lists where you are contacted by predatory publishers, predatory conferences, uh, and vanity publishing books, etc. And this is a big issue. Uh, now, it's, it's been around for some time now, predatory publishing, but it is on the rise. And, and thankfully, we now actually have a definition for predatory journals. And this came out in late 2019. So when we're talking about predatory journals and distinguishing these from other types of journals, perhaps legitimate journals, we're talking about predatory journals and publishers who are entities that prioritise self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterised by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices, such as those um, emails and invitations that bombard uh, inboxes. Now, this all results in an absolute massive waste of time. Uh, it's estimated that uh, just the amount of time that academics, researchers, clinicians have to deal with cleaning out their inboxes uh, leads to about uh, to over a billion dollars in terms of wasted time and resources uh, across the globe. And even though it may only take a few minutes or, or so each day, it's still, it's still, if you add it all up, uh, a huge waste and drain on the academic community. The other problem is the university systems uh, uh, put in more and more strict controls of inboxes, and this might actually um, prevent some commu communications getting through. But that's just the start of the problem when it comes to predatory journals. Yes, it is a huge waste of time, but perhaps more importantly, the studies that are published in these predatory journals don't actually contain information uh, that is required to advance science or care. And there's a few different reasons for this. Firstly, uh, we know that most of these studies are often poorly conducted and have reporting issues. So they don't actually, they aren't actually useful in terms of informing policy or practice. As we've discussed today as well, there's also issues in these journals regarding error, fraud and plagiarism and fabricated data as we've discussed. And even those studies which are genuine and have been done with the uh, with the right approach um, and honest in an honest fashion, let's say. The problem is that when they are published in these predatory journals, these journals are so poorly disseminated and uh, that their studies aren't uh, often indexed in major medical databases and these journals don't adhere to digital archiving uh, procedures that it, they're actually incredibly hard to find. So even if there is a really good quality study, a rare good quality study that is published in one of these journals, it's incredibly hard to find uh, or access. So what this means is that the research and studies, the good studies that are published in here, uh, it actually really, really often, quite often goes nowhere. And it's not, these studies are not contributing to the translational health pathway at, or contributing to science. And this is a huge problem because for a lot of academics and particularly early career academics or trainees who may uh, get caught up and, and publish in these journals, it is a huge waste of their, uh, of their time and their effort and their resources as they publish in these journals and then, and then really that these articles often go down a black hole and are incredibly hard to discover. <laughs> 
And additionally, what's, what's really worrisome is that when there are studies published on real data, and let's talk about preclinical research here and animal studies, often uh, it is an absolute waste of, of these animals um, who might need to be exterminated following that study. And so it's just a complete waste uh, of, of all of these um, animals as well. And of course, it's a waste uh, of clinicians and patients and others who actually uh, volunteer or sign up to be within a study or to help uh, undertake a study as well. Um, so a huge waste of so much time and effort and limited resources. And alternatively, we also know that these, these journals are a hotbed for pseudoscience, uh, error, fraud and fabricated data as well. Uh, uh, and uh, a boon for fields like homeopathy, which is really, really a concern. So that's predatory journals. And now I want to move on to systematic reviews and predatory journals. So uh, we started getting incre an increasing amount of questions here at JBI about what we should do with studies from predatory journals in our systematic reviews. And when we formed our, our, our group in uh, 2020, uh, there really wasn't much written on this subject. There were a handful of papers, um, one coming out from one of our centres in Canada, but not a lot on actual predatory journals and studies from predatory journals in evidence synthesis. Um, thankfully, there was one large meta-epidemiological study which had been conducted, which actually looked at the impact of in including studies from predatory journals in systematic reviews, but really not much else at that time. So what we did was we formed a, a subcommittee and a working group to actually investigate this issue with the aim of hoping to do some research into this topic, perhaps some meta-epidemiological research, but also some focus groups, some qualitative work into getting people's experiences and views on including studies from predatory journals in systematic reviews, uh, all with the aim of actually generating some, some guidance for systematic reviewers. And this is a wonderful uh, uh, working group here with, with some of our members and particularly uh, uh, wanted to highlight Larissa Shams here from Canada, who has um, done a lot of work and research into this issue of predatory journals. So one of the big questions that we've asked a few times now by different medians is, should we include articles or studies published in predatory journals in systematic reviews? And we've done surveys and focus groups uh, to try to answer this question. And what we get whenever we do answer this question is uh, a lot of diverse opinion and not a lot of certainty amongst uh, systematic reviewers. These are systematic reviewers here. So you can see here about 15% say yes, 15% say no. Uh, the majority say it depends. And then, and then some people say, I don't know. And it's interesting when you delve into the reasons for why people say yes or no and what you need to do there, once again, is a lot of different opinions that, that exist. And, you know, for, ranging from um, predatory journals aren't actually an issue, we don't need to focus on it, uh, to uh, very clear um, opinions that we definitely should never include any studies from predatory journals. Uh, to opinions about, well, we should include studies from predatory journals and what we currently do in systematic reviews in terms of risk of bias is more than enough already. So that leads to follow on discussions that if we accept the premise that we can include studies and should include studies from predatory journals if we come across them in our systematic review, is assessment of risk of bias adequate to deal with these studies? And once again, there's, there's um, not a clear consensus on this topic. And we can see uh, there's a lot of different suggestions um, about how we may handle these studies. And that leads me to um, the last section of this presentation, which is on our interim guidance for systematic reviewers, which has been informed by uh, our surveys and focus groups and our literature, and also a lot of discussions amongst our group. And we've recently published this article, uh, which you can access in uh, the JBI Journal for Evidence Synthesis. So basically, uh, this is interim guidance for now, but basically there's two options. Uh, as a systematic reviewer, you may decide to exclude studies um, from predatory journals, or you may decide to include studies from predatory journals. And if you decide to exclude studies from predatory journals, there's a few steps that we will need to take. We'll need to be careful about where we search, uh, so we're not going to increase the chances of actually encountering these studies. And we may also uh, then need a process to identify studies from journals uh, that are likely to be predatory. And we might need to use checklists and criteria. 
Now, if we say it's, we are going to include studies from predatory journals or not automatically exclude studies from predatory journals, there's a few different approaches once again we may choose to take. We may do actually no additional measures. We may just say what we currently do in systematic reviews uh, is fine. Uh, in this case, we might not have any restrictions on our searching as well. However, if we are concerned about studies from predatory journals, we might need to go beyond risk of bias assessment and start looking at using additional tools. Some of the tools and strategies, for example, that Ben and Lisa have already talked about this morning uh, and being that research detective. And we can also investigate perhaps the impact of including studies from predatory journals using sensitivity or subgroup analyses. But the main thing is uh, what we're saying in this article is no matter what approach you, you say you're going to do, make sure you specify your approach and your protocol and always transparently report what, what strategies you will take. So just quickly going into some of these in a little bit more detail. So when you say uh, you don't want to encounter predatory, uh, predatory journals in your systematic review, we need to be aware that uh, as when we're searching for the literature, that actually um, predatory journals are infiltrating uh, major, major medical databases, uh, such as PubMed Central. Uh, uh, and this is due to the um, open access funding requirements from the National Institutes of Health, for example. We also need to be careful about searching places like Google Scholar, which automatically draws the internet and indexes anything that looks academic. And additionally, we'll need to be careful if we are doing onward citation searching uh, for our systematic reviews as well, because from the reference lists of our included studies, they may actually be citing a predatory journal or a study from a predatory journal. Now, in terms of identifying studies from predatory journal, there are a lot of different checklists that exist that we can use. Um, there's there's uh, over 93 of these checklists that you could select. Uh, and interestingly, one of these checklists was actually published in a predatory journal, so I'm not sure about using that one. Uh, mainly these checklists are largely similar, but unfortunately at the moment there is no gold standard um, checklist. And one of the issues um, that, that, that makes it so difficult is that there is really, there's this spectrum in terms of um, characteristics of predatory journals and characteristics of legitimate journals. And even your more traditional legitimate journals may have some issues with their peer review practices or other, other areas um, that may be similar to predatory journals. So there's not necessarily always a clear cutoff. Uh, so as such, once again, we'll need to specify in our protocol what threshold we would use to identify, uh, if we're using a checklist, um, to identify studies from predatory journals. Uh, and we'd want to make sure we're using um, one of the better checklists available. And we also need to be careful about um, our judgments and assumptions as well, and, and realize that some of these predatory journals perhaps aren't necessarily predatory in their intent, but maybe they're just an early or novice journal and it's just starting to be established. And this is why it's perhaps not indexed in, in, in some databases and perhaps why um, they haven't got all of their things in order yet. So we need to be aware of that also. Uh, and there's also a really useful website that we can use to help us uh, when planning our submission um, called Think, Check, Submit. Now, just quickly, there are lists that we can check as well. Um, and just interestingly, you can see here, this is how many publishers were included in Bill's list before it got shut down because of um, coercion and intimidation uh, attempts and addresses to Bill. Uh, but you can see that this is an issue which is growing exponentially. And at the moment, unfortunately, there is no list uh, to rule them all for either verified or predatory journals. And there is a little bit of a crossover. So these lists aren't perfect. Now, if we do decide to include studies from predatory, uh, predatory journals in our systematic review, uh, once again, the issues that we might be concerned about as systematic reviewers are, are fraud or error and obviously poor quality research. And detecting low quality or poor quality research and risk of bias is it's relatively straightforward for systematic reviewers. We, we, we know what we're doing. Um, there's, there's tools available to help us with this process. But as we've discussed about this morning already, detecting error and fraud is probably a bit harder and it's not something that is really um, included yet uh, in, in uh, systematic review guidance or training. And you know, you can't just trust peer review as we've talked about, and even critical appraisal or risk of bias may, may miss errors of fraud or, or, or error. Uh, 
And I won't go into these too much here, but these are just some strategies that we've, we've, we've suggested may be useful in terms of detecting error and fraud. Um, and uh, it's really pleasing to see the work of Lisa and Ben about developing checklists and guidance for screening tools or whatever it may be um, um, to perhaps uh, indicate a high likelihood of error or fraud in studies. And, and there are also, as, as has been mentioned, statistical tests um, that we can run uh, or queries that we can run to test the data to see if it's likely to be true. So there's still a lot of questions left, um, but we are, we are working on it as a group and it's great to see others are as well. And so uh, although we've provided um, some interim guidance and solutions and considerations that you might, might like to follow, we've got no hard and fast rules yet. And uh, we need to do some further meta epi, epi, epi work and uh, keep working together to produce more guidance. Uh, and that is all I have today. Uh, but thank you all for your time and looking forward to any, any questions. Thank you very much, Zach. Uh, it's very insightful about predatory journals. We do have a couple of questions which um, I'll just um, put to you. The first is uh, what your definition is of a legitimate journal? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a tricky one uh, because and it took a long time to come up with a defi definition for a predatory journal, I must say, uh, from the group. So I guess a legitimate journal, it's one that perhaps adheres to um, standard editorial uh, or best practice editorial uh, procedures, such as those from COPE or um, WAIM or other organisations um, that has uh, peer review. Uh, uh, I guess it's, it's largely the opposite of those characteristics that we talked about of predatory journals. Um, but, but once again, we, we also need to acknowledge that uh, so-called legitimate journals um, can be duped. Um, they can publish erroneous or fraudulent research. Um, sometimes um, some journals will have better peer review or editorial practices in place than others as well. And just uh, one question before we bring the panel together. Um, how does the question of whether to include data from predatory journals relate to the question of whether to include from great literature, literature, which is generally recommended. Yeah, so uh, great literature. So that's that's it's a really good question, and that's that's my personal opinion that you shouldn't necessarily use publication status um, as an inclusion or exclusion criteria in systematic reviews. So um, just because something is published in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, uh, or not published in a peer reviewed journal, such as grey literature or trial registries or whatever it may be, I think we still need to be open to including anything. Um, grey literature is really just literature which is not published in these commercial peer reviewed journals. Um, and uh, it could include things from governments, NGOs, etc. Um, I think that's separate because the, I guess the intention is um, hopefully they're coming from credible more credible bodies than these, these predators. Excellent. Thanks very much, Zach. Okay, I'd like to uh, now bring the panellists back together. So if you can share your video um, and unmute yourselves. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we're now also, uh, Lisa, Professor Lisa Barrow is joining us. Uh, she's a professor of medicine and public health from the University of Colorado. Um, so we're at time and obviously if people need to leave, they can do so, but I think there's uh, been a lot of interest in this session. So we might have time for a few questions for the panel to um, and conclude the session about um, 10 past 11. So please, if you um, have some questions from the panelists, put them in the chat or the Q&A, either is fine. You can even raise your hand and verbally ask your question also. Um, so to kick off, I guess, uh, one question I had, which is really around the um, fraudulent data, is what would make it easier for us to identify fraudulent data as systematic reviewers? Um, so maybe if we could start with um, Ben, and then Lisa might have some. My answer would be the availability of original data with the primary publication and, and and actually if you talk about systematic review you're already halfway a polluted river so so the effort should be in keeping the river clean with 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 the process of peer review and accepting papers but otherwise 
publishing an original data set anonymized as an Excel spreadsheet on the on the website of the of the journal will be very powerful. It's been and and Lisa Barrow, do you think um, is that part of kind of Cochrane's um, planned approach around to to deal with this particular issue? Yeah, I mean, I have to say uh, the devil is in the details. I really appreciated all these talks because, um, you know, it makes me think of the implementation guide for our policy on problematic studies, which is much, 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 much longer than the policy itself, <laughs> because it gives a lot of options. And I would agree with Ben that that is one of the things that we suggest that reviewers ask for. But it's interesting because reviewers have told me, well, you know, when I ask for the data, I actually don't want it. I use it as a red flag to indicate that uh, something's wrong with the study, but I don't know what to do with it when I get it. So just getting the data isn't enough. We have to have the skills and the resources and the time to actually look at that data. And in our policy, for example, one of the things we have in the guide is, you know, form letters and suggested um, templates for reviewers to use when they're contacting authors or um, editors about problematic studies, because we think, you know, those contacts can be more effective if they use this, this kind of template. So we're trying to make it easier, but it does take resources, as has been noted for um, the predatory journals as well, digging into them. Yeah, exactly. And, and Lisa Parker, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, look, I'm hearing the same things, that the individual patient data is very useful, but um, not everyone knows how to deal with it, and it's incredibly time consuming, and you need content knowledge to really interrogate it. And um, so it's it's useful but there are limitations there so you know i think uh, you know maybe cochrane could be a real leader here by helping to upskill people in in all the other tools that might be useful in this area you know the things that we talked about all of us in our studies and, and i think there's a there's a lot of strength in that and benefits that could come from that also if we can get some sort of early warnings just like zach was talking about with the predatory journals too then we can funnel uh, the studies that need to have the deeper investigation and potentially have you know some more central support for those kind of deeper investigations. Yes, um, thank you for that. So there's a question uh, here for Ben. You mentioned about uh, that about 20% of papers were problematic. Do you have a sense of how much of that issue um, is due to a single author, authors publishing multiple problematic papers and uh, what is the true extent of the problem? Uh, definitely, it's 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 an author who publishes a series of papers that are likely to be all fabricated. I have difficulty believe that somebody does honest RCTs and then makes others up at the same time. I, I think if you publish fabricated RCTs, you should consider everything suspected. And I'm I'm going to say something controversial, but compared to uh, the Olympic Games, where Russia is not allowed to participate unless the athletes are cleaned on their separate flag, we should consider that for some countries in the world also. It's very controversial, but if we can't cope with detecting what is right and what is wrong, we should, we should basically leave out uh, particular countries um, in the interest of the safety of patients. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess that is <clears throat> quite controversial and, um, and you know, potentially discriminatory towards good research that may come out of those countries, and, and particularly if those countries are low middle income countries and... Yeah, but R Russian athletes are still allowed to compete at the Olympics as long as they can prove that they are clean. So you should set up a process for that. But what you're going to do there is you're going to switch the burden of proof to the to the author and say, unless you prove that you have done trustworthy research, we're not going to use it. Um, I guess a related question around this is really, you know, some of this arises through kind of governance um, processes and, and perhaps a lack of governance processes in, in certain countries. So, uh, you know, as, as systematic review authors, um, we often are the ones to identify the problems in primary research. Um, and that has allowed us to, in fact, um, I think probably over time improve primary research because we feed back 
the problems that we identify and, and that kind of feeds back in a loop to improve primary research. So in this case here, I mean, this seems another kind of obvious learning as systematic reviewers, you know, other ways as systematic reviewers that we should be saying, look, you know, there needs to be improvement and sharing of individual participant data um, in terms of improved governance systems uh, across countries um, and, and what you think about that. Um, Lisa, Vera? Yeah, so um, I've had some discussions around this uh, with um, protocols, uh, something near and dear to your heart, Joe. And um, there's, uh, so for example, there's networks of clinical trialists in Africa who were doing uh, COVID studies. And even though some people in Cochrane have recommended that you should just ignore trials if they're small or ignore trials um, if they're not registered, there, uh, recommendation was that you should uh, look for trials that adhere to a central protocol. And I think this is a really interesting point because if we have a, a centrally uh, developed uh, protocol and there are many you know, countries participating with, from individual trial centers uh, that are adhering to that protocol, uh, that's a whole different beast actually than a bunch of separate different trials. So I think that's one way to address the governance issue is to really um, you know, look for studies uh, that have been done with these um, larger centrally approved protocols. Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, so I might come back to some of the questions that are coming through. We've got lots of questions. Um, so the first one here is, what is the recommended process for editors, authors, and guideline developers to deal with published systematic reviews, including um, potential fraudulent data? Zach, do you want to uh, perhaps address that from um, your JBI perspective? Yeah, I can, I can have a go. At the moment, we don't really have any uh, rigorous policies in, in place uh, to look at this, and um, hence, hence why we're trying to work out some interim guidance. But um, just, just highlighting, I, I know the question about the retracted Wakefield article, um, and that's one of the benefits, I guess, of these at uh, least papers that are published in peer-reviewed literature, legitimate journals, that they can be retracted and hopefully you'll be able to identify retracted papers. Whereas when they are published in predatory journals, they, they won't be retracted even if they're called fraudulent or fabricated. Um, but I definitely think it is, it's, um, we need to keep looking at see these types of systems um, to try to check for fraudulent data. Thank you. Um, it's yes. a great question, and, and I think it's, you know, it's surprisingly easy for retracted articles to stay out there in, um, in guidelines and in systematic reviews. You know, look, I'm not as tech savvy as, as I'd need to be to manage this, but wouldn't it be great if we had a system that automatically popped up a flag whenever um, a study had been rejected and uh, all the citations that have used that study got a flag? You know, surely there's some computer person out there who can sort that system out. That's all we need, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and even make the retractions more visible, right? I mean, the retractions yeah. itself are, I, I reviewed a paper this morning where the author cited the retracted paper and I went on the website, I can't see that it's retracted. So that, that whole system is still kind of taboo, I think, and really needs improvement. And I, I fully agree with Lisa that there must be automatic ways to make that immediately feasible. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, one of the things uh, that I've been hearing is that people who do systematic reviews need to have a specialist information person on their team so that they know how to find these retracted studies. And, and you know, Cochrane will often have that, but, but not every systematic review team will have a dedicated librarian or information specialist who's specifically looking out to see if any of those um, Things uh, included studies have been retracted, and, and that's just that's got to be fundamental. Yeah, and I know Cochrane's been working on a way uh, the IT specialist there, Robin Featherstone, in particular, to flag um, retracted studies that would come up in Central. That was one of the the questions. Um, but you know, again, that's going to help uh, Cochrane and maybe prevent this uh, from happening with, if people are using Central. But it needs to be much much more widespread to make these easy uh, to identify, and also. 
you know, we're, de we're working on a little project to develop some web scraper for PubPeer. Um, PubPeer is a lot easy, you know, they identify a lot of problems with studies PubPeer, but you can't really search it and they're, you know, they're not categorized the problems. And so trying to develop an automated way to do that would also be useful. Great. Thank you all. Look, I think um, we should draw this to a close. We're at 10 past 11 now. Um, there's been lots of questions, I can tell you, and we've only got through a fraction of them. So I think this really shows the interest in this area. Um, while it's alarming, I think it will be good to kind of, um, it, it's great to see that, that we are thinking about this in Cochrane more broadly. So I'd like to thank today's speakers, um, panelists, Ben, Lisa Parker, Zach, and Lisa Barrow for all your engaging presentations and insight into this issue and um, helping us to kind of think through the ramifications of this. Um, a big thank you also to the participants who have really engaged within this session. I'm sorry I haven't been able to get to uh, many of your questions. Um, and thank you, of course, to the organisers for putting together this plenary. Um, I can see the next session starts at 11.30 and I